Today, we'll learn how to create your perfect family history book. I'm your trainer, Lori Coffey, and your perfect family history book is the one that meets your goals. We've got a lot of ideas now, so we pick up the pen and write what? Yikes! Writer's block! <laughs> Next, we'll give you a boatload of content ideas so we can create, like Hemingway. Remember, the goal of content is to turn your family history into memorable stories. Let's look at ways to do that. Do you have an ancestor who makes you feel incredibly proud, who did something extraordinary and possibly even changed the course of history? It could be a great grandmother who fought for the vote or a third great grandfather who fought heroically in a war. Their story may be the reason you started in genealogy in the first place. Tell your readers the whole story of the special person and why you think they're special. Their life story might be worth two or more pages in your book. Tell the story of your family name. My maiden name is Regor, not a word in any language. We have no idea where we came from. However, Rieger is a word in Dutch, meaning blue heron, which is funny because the first Riegers, down to my dad, were short and stocky, the opposite of a blue heron. The mystery continues. And that may be how it goes into the book. <laughs> Buri Taskar is definitely a unique name and hard to say. He explains that Buri might be from Van Buren. The Taskar is from the Irish Tasca. On the first day of school, they asked him what his name was. Being an old Southern boy, he said, Taskar. So it's been spelled Taskar ever since. Tell the story of repeated family names. For example, we have a Mos Moses Marmaduke. What a name. Moses Marmaduke in multiple generations. I found out that during the revolution, he was the English commander who let our patriot ancestor go after capture since he didn't want to hang a dying man. Our ancestor escaped to freedom, had 10 children, and named one after the kind-hearted red coat. They followed for several generations. Isn't that cool? What a story. Who knew? Don't let the story of special family heirlooms die on your watch. Give meaning to the item like this Dumbo pottery figure. My mother was 11 when the movie came out. Like Fantasia the year before, she was enthralled by the artwork. Even though the family was poor, her mother bought this little figure for her to encourage the artists within. I'm not going to let that story die. Even without a cute photo, dry statistics can become a memorable story. By family group, decade or century, location, or even maternal side versus paternal. For example, I researched all the descendants of my best ancestor and found these statistics about what they had in common with our patriarch. That was pretty cool. How about average number of children? Number of children who died or who lived? Parents age at first or last child? Age between spouses? I have an ancestor in Germany who actually had to sign a document saying she understood that her husband was going to be much older than her if she married this man and that he likely wouldn't be around to raise her children. And she had to sign it. And she did become a widow with two children, but she was a wealthy widow, <laughs> which was a much better life than she would have had if she hadn't married him. Average lifespan or the oldest ancestor. I had an ancestor who was 100. She was born in 1754. And she lived to be a hundred. It's an amazing story what she'd seen. Lots or little migration. What trends have you seen in your tree? Look for them and write about them. Which of their traits are similar to another ancestor? For example, my 15th great-grandfather, John Alden, who was famous and so there was a lot written about him, migrated from England to the wilds of New England. My third great-grandfather, William Boynton, migrated from New England to the wilds of Chicago. Alden had a sex successful career in building houses, Boynton in designing buildings. Both were elected officials, and both had long, happy marriages with big families. Here's an example of a co comparison to show how different they are. How many descendants per generation did they have? Look at that. One had 238 in three generations. The other only had 51. Does that tell you a little bit about birth control <laughs> and the fact that the kids did not want, in fact, many of them didn't even marry. They didn't uh, want to marry. I used Excel to trace all the children so that I could do these numbers, figure them out. Explain your family relationship to that famous person we all have stories about. 
Explain how you found a tricky or hard to find ancestor. Like this uh, example of a baby named for his baby daddy, a young bride's husband, who left her to join the Confederates during the war. She warned him that if he left, she wouldn't be there when he came back. True to her word, she went back to her daddy and called the baby after him. It was confusing when Tasker was doing this research to know the name that he was called in the family versus the records. Similar to finding tricky ancestors is any genealogy mistake you made and how you fixed it. Here's another idea to consider. After years of research, we have all learned about genealogy, but our readers, not so much. We can add little road signs like this call out that says, the farther back in history you go, the harder to find records, which we know, but grandson wouldn't know. And the great, great grandson who hasn't even been born yet won't know. Another says the people, the more people with the same name, the more direct their relationship to us. They're just little, little directions along the way. The goal of all experienced researchers is to fill in the why behind the what. For example, why would British landed gentry with a title leave the comforts of home in England for the wilds of America? Adventure? Nope. They chose the wrong side in the King Charles I debate. <laughs> that certainly makes a good story. Some other whys? Why did they leave then? Why didn't they have children? Why was he or she a boarder or lodger? There's some very sad stories about that. I hired a professional German researcher who told the entire story of her hunt for my ancestors, even when she didn't have them. <laughs> Sometimes the notes you have gathered in your family tree contain useful information. If you use them, be sure to give credit to the original author, if available, and edit as needed. You don't need to show the whole thing. Similar to notes is a direct quote from a document called a pull quote. Here we pulled it and listed the source. I also showed an image of the record. We'll show more design tips like this later. Find ways to tie your ancestors to historical events, like this very sad list of family members who died in the Holocaust called Shoah in the Jewish tradition. Tell the story of the neighborhood, like this photo montage featuring a part of the 1940 census, a picture of the building, uh, a map of where it was in greater Chicago. Thank you, Google Street Maps. Tell the story of the times, like a brief Jewish history in their family town, starting with only 10 families in the 1600s, and the image of a fascinating tomb with a blessing hand carved in, live long and prosper. <laughs> this page is mostly photos with a very interesting blurb. I mean, and where do you go for those kind of blurbs? I go to Google, right? You Google it, the town, the his history of Jews in Mulhouse and found interesting information all the way back to 58 BCE. If you're in a hurry to create a book and don't want to write a lot of content, Ancestry can help. There's Tool Story Scout under the Trees tab, writes a short story and combines it with pictures for you. Copy and paste it from Ancestry into PowerPoint. It's short and to the point. Interview with your oldest relative. I never got to meet either of my grandfathers. I did get to meet my mother's father's little brother, but at 93, he didn't quite understand who I was. <laughs> the granddaughter of his brother's second wife, the one he thought destroyed his brother's first marriage. <laughs> That's not the story I knew. Maybe it goes in the book, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> If your audience includes children and teens, consider at least one interesting activity for them that involves family research to help them understand their ancestors and experience the fun of learning about them, like dress up and act out family stories with costumes and props. For older kids, encourage them to do a Google or an archives.gov search for their favorite relative, or even challenge them to become an expert in History Hub or another great resource that you don't have time to learn, and then they can be your go-to person. When my aunt died, she left three letters from her mother, my grandma, Detta. Detta had died when my dad was only 16, so his memories of her were faded. The letters were not. I got a wonderful glimpse into her daily routine, putting up vegetables, trying to keep baby chicks alive, giving advice to her oldest daughters. Later, I shared the transcriptions with the cousins on Facebook, and they all loved them and appreciated seeing them. You can show selected lines, or all the content that shows details that you don't get anywhere else. 
I felt like I met her. If the content is important, like this letter of her life, you may want to publish the whole thing and illustrate it. If you have a stack of interesting letters, they may deserve their own book. While you are writing the contents of your book, keep it simple, sweetheart. We say kiss. <laughs> Instead of sharing just a boring list of begots and dull facts, tell your ancestor's history as a story with plot twists, inspiration, and humor. Use fewer but more descriptive words that take us there. Enrich the story with details that bring to life the history around them. This is creative nonfiction.